And welcome everyone uh, to our Labor Notes uh, caucus building webinar. And this is one of a couple that we're going to be doing. And uh, this is about getting started on building a caucus. A uh, couple of pieces of logistics before we introduce ourselves. Uh, we are recording this, and so uh, we have turned off the video uh, for everybody who is uh, uh, not speaking. Um, and if you want to change your name, if you're anxious at all about that in terms of being recorded, you can do that. Um, we've also muted everybody, and we've turned off the chat for now. Uh, after we hear from our panelists, we will take questions, and at that point, we will turn the chat back on, and you can put your questions in. We didn't want to do that too soon because we were afraid we would lose some of your questions uh, over the 45 minutes or so that we're going to be hearing from our panelists. Um, so with that, welcome again. Uh, my name is Barbara Mataloni. I am a staff organizer at Labor Notes. And I am delighted to work with my comrade, Lisa, who's going to introduce herself in a moment. Um, just to say a little bit about me before we get started, I've been with Labor Notes for five years now. Uh, my work with Labor Notes is primarily with educators, uh, K through higher education, and also uh, through that with uh, reform leaders and caucuses. I come out of a caucus myself, Educators for a Democratic Union, in the Massachusetts Teachers Association, uh, where I was president, uh, having been elected out of that caucus uh, before I came to Labor Notes. Uh, so really excited to be here, excited to see the level of interest that we're getting in caucuses uh, at Labor Notes. So Lucy, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, so um, Barbara said, I also am an organizer at Labor Notes. Um, I've only been on the Labor Notes staff for about four and a half months now. Before that, I was a staff organizer for Unite All Workers for Democracy, uh, UAWD, the Reform Caucus in the UAW. Um, I work very closely with one of our panelists, Scott Holdison, on campaigns to win one member, one vote in the UAW and on our successful campaign to elect seven reform candidates to the UAW International Executive Board, including Sean Fain. So that's what I was doing the last couple of years. Um, before that, I was a rank and file UAW member. Um, and um, I'm also very excited about this series and our great panelists tonight. So um, Barbara, do you wanna say anything more? Should we? Yeah, just to talk a little bit real briefly about how we think about caucuses uh, in labor notes, what we mean when we say caucus, you're going to find uh, people use the word caucus in unions themselves in different ways. Uh, when we're talking about caucuses in labor notes, we're talking about groups of members who get together because they have a shared vision of the kind of union that they want. Uh, and the caucuses that we're talking about um, don't need to be sanctioned by the union. Uh, sometimes we'll hear about caucuses in some unions that are just sort of, they're, they're just thinking of themselves as like a slate running for office. Uh, and that's sanctioned by the union. We're not thinking of it that way. Uh, although that may be one manifestation of a caucus. Uh, the caucus that I'm at of Educators for a Democratic Union in the Mass Teachers Association, Mass Teachers actually has a policy that says that there can be no caucuses uh, in the union. Um, we said, well, we're not asking for your approval to meet as a group of members to talk to each other about the kind of union we want. We are not of the Massachusetts Teachers Association. We are in the Massachusetts Teachers Association. Uh, so that's, that's what we're thinking about as we do this. And we're going to be spending this session and then a couple of sessions uh, beyond this talking about what does it mean to be a caucus? Why and how do workers come together to be a caucus and what's some of the work that we can do as a caucus uh, to transform our unions. I imagine many of you have been to our What to Do in the Union Breaks Your, your Heart workshops, uh, or maybe you've been to our uh, Secrets of a Successful Organizer, uh, where in Beating Apathy, you'll hear about people talking about feeling that the union is breaking your heart. When we're thinking about caucuses, we're thinking about what can we do as union members 
committed to union work and to, committed to unions as critical sites of transformation uh, to move our unions to be the unions that we want them to be democratic, transparent, led by the rank and file and willing to take on fights. So with that, uh, I'm going to invite our panelists to introduce themselves. We didn't say what order, order we're going to do this in. Uh, so, uh, Shira, go ahead. I didn't know I was going to be first. Hi, everyone. I didn't, I didn't know you were going to be first either. Amazing. Um, <laughs> hi, everyone. Um, I feel really honored to be here with all of you and all of our panelists. I'm Shira. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I'm from Philadelphia. I'm a middle school teacher in our school district um, in the city. I'm a member of the Philadelphia Federation of Teachers and an organizer with the Caucus of Working Educators. Um, I've been a teacher for 13 years and I've been a member of our union for eight. Um, I started my journey as uh, a teacher in a non-unionized charter school um, and found my way to our caucus and then into the union and into a public school. Um, and I'm excited to share some of uh, the work that we've done with you all tonight. Great. Nora, go ahead. Hi, I'm Nora. Um, so I'm a storyboard artist and a writer in animation. Um, and I live in Los Angeles. And that makes me covered under um, IATSE in the Animation Guild. Uh, I'm in IATSE Local 839. Um, and IATSE is, uh, uh, we cover um, theater, uh, motion picture workers, stagecraft workers, live events workers, um, and theme park workers. Uh, and um, I do a lot of uh, organizing in my union and uh, our recently formed caucus is called Crew. It's uh, the caucus of rank and file um, entertainment workers. Um, so I'm honored to be <laughs> with you guys here tonight. Um, I think um, you guys are uh, wonderful superstars to be around. Great. Thanks, Nora. And Scott. Well, I want to say thank you for uh, inviting me to uh, to join in this panel. Uh, my name is Scott Holdison. I'm an auto worker from uh, uh, Ford Chicago Assembly Plant. That's uh, UAW Local 551 in Chicago. Uh, I've been uh, an auto worker for uh, 34 years. And I'm one of the founding members of the Unite All Workers for Democracy Caucus. And we're going to talk a lot uh, more about UAWD during the course of this. So uh, I'll just say that about it right now. Uh, I also uh, chair the steering committee for UAWD. And uh, I want to say that uh, Lisa is a rock star organizer for uh, UAWD. Uh, she was the glue that held us together through some really tough times. And UAWD would certainly not exist without Scott. So I um, have to say. Um, okay, thank you everyone for introducing yourselves. Um, we're gonna move into our round of questions. So we would like all the panelists to answer this question. Maybe we can go in the order in which you did introductions. So Shara, Nora, um, and then Scott. So the questions are, how did you discover each other, the initial members of the caucus, as like-minded people? And then what goals or concerns did you all share in common? So those are the questions. Um, so Shara, uh, go ahead. Great. Um, so our, the story of the Caucus of Working Educators in Philly um, precedes me. Um, it was founded in... 2014, um, and I came in a couple of years later. And so the in terms of the founding of we, um, that like story is very important. And there were a, basically like the short version is there were a lot of people who were stewards in our union who were really trying to make change in terms of getting union leadership to get on board with like different kinds of campaigns and like move on different social justice issues. And we're really unsuccessful. And so like the initial like spur of the caucus of working educators was just like a real frustration, I think, with the contradictions in the school district of Philadelphia, the timeline of which you can find online. I won't go into a ton of detail, but 
um, horrible, draconian um, austerity about 10 years ago were creating conditions that were really awful and people were really upset by the fact that um, our union leadership wasn't taking action. So the first founding of work, the Caucus of Working Educators really came from that um, in like 2013, 2014. Since then, I think like we've been through um, many rounds of founding. And I think that like I was taking some notes before tonight, um, some of the things that brought us together were, I'm just looking at my notes, were like really wanting to organize deeply in our buildings, um, in our school buildings. There are 220 schools in the school district of Philadelphia. And as many of you have probably felt in your own unions, the shops are very separate from the union leadership. Like one is here and one is here. And people so desperately wanted to make changes in their shops, which for us are our school buildings, but we're not getting enough support to do that in really deep ways. Um, people often found have found that their only work in terms of unionism is like being a building rep and running some meetings and like being a liaison between the members and our administration. And so a lot of our current members and organizers in the caucus really want to do deep, powerful development work in our schools so that we can get really powerful wins on the ground and not wait for our school district leadership to make changes around things like class size and working conditions and safety and all of those things, or wait for our union leadership to take action on them either. Um, so that was one theme that really brought us together. And I think that another thing that I was thinking about was like a real desire um, and feeling of like solidarity is something that has brought people together in our caucus over the last two or three years, especially since the pandemic started in March of 2020. Um, I think that during that time, like the lives of students and families and educators in the city of Philadelphia um, were under attack in like this really um, awful way where people, if they were sent back into school buildings, really feared that they were going to die. And as we've seen across the country, I think since then, like the pandemic set off or like surfaced this feeling of like, what is going to happen with our lives and our livelihoods in terms of our schools. And so I think since um, March of 2020, the Caucus of Working Educators has brought in people who want that feeling of solidarity where people are really going to have your back and like go to battle with you and not necessarily go to battle um, on a picket line. Like we have not had an official strike um, during that time, but like really go to battle with a difficult administrator or go to battle over really difficult working conditions in our schools and also go to battle over some policies and issues that are affecting our teachers and educators, every kind of educator across the city. So I think like really wanting to organize deeply in our shops, I'm going to like go back and forth between school building and shop because I know that both are important. Um, I sometimes call our school our shop at school and people are like, what are you talking about? Um, so I'm learning to use both interchangeably. So like this really desire to organize deeply in our school buildings. And then also, um, I think since the pandemic, a deep desire for solidarity and really backing each other up um, in our in our workplaces. And I'm just thinking about something that I think somebody said earlier at the beginning during introductions, like really making that distinction between the union and union members and like really living into what it means to be a union member and a union leader on the ground and not waiting for somebody who runs the union, um, whatever that means in your particular workplace to do it for us. So organizing and a desire for solidarity have been really important um, for our people in Philly. Thanks, Shira. Um, Nora, go ahead. Yeah. Um, uh, so how uh, sort of we discovered each other um, for our caucus was um, we uh, found each other surrounding the 2021 basic agreement that IATSE was negotiating. And for those who don't remember, in 2021, IATSE held a strike authorization vote for the first time in many decades. So their union, you know, we came out for them with a 98% authorization and 87% participating. And the members, you know, they saw their union use the most powerful tool available to them for the first time in decades. And um, they saw what kind of contract it got them. Um, 
uh, you know, this was a time when we needed the union to be strong for us. There were articles about this that um, brought the community on board, but motion picture workers were working and still are working 15, 16 hour days for weeks on end with no breaks, no weekends. People had stories of driving these long drives home, nearly crashing their cars. People, some did did crash their cars um, and, uh, you know, on, on set safety being a really big thing for them. Um, uh, and the contract really didn't address it. There was this fundamental understanding that it wasn't merely our members holding us back from wielding more power. Um, you know, we gave them this 98% authorization vote, um, but it, and it wasn't merely bargaining techniques, but it was the way that the union was operating. Um, despite having the strength of the member base, the union wasn't operating from a, a place of strength. So in 21, there was this group um, that I uh, kind of uh, banded onto, formed around the Hollywood locals, but it eventually fell apart because it was primarily focused on um, campaigning for issues instead of changing the way that the union was working. We knew we wanted to form this caucus, so uh, we uh, got together another group and we rallied around labor notes actually in 2022 as the vector we knew like a bunch of national unions would coalesce so we organized around it knowing we'd meet IATSE members from all over and we wanted to build a coalition of members at, out of that and what we shared in common fundamentally was that we all deserve more I think everyone in IATSE would agree with that but I think what we shared in common the most was um how we wanted to get that uh, we made like this direct connection between achieving what we wanted in our workplaces and the amount of avenues of participation we had. So we all had experiences with union bureaucracy that were unsatisfying and frustrating. And as an 839 number in Los Angeles, my health care, for instance, is affected by bargaining that takes place without any input from my membership because our contract is, um, our contract is bargained separately um, and our contracts healthcare that is something that IATSE negotiates. It's de facto tacked on to my contract. So I found that I shared things in common with people from uh, Local 52 in New York and Philly. Um, they're also affected by the, the basic agreement in a similar way. So we had the same problems across all these state lines and across different types of jobs. Uh, you know, one person might be working as a construction worker on a uh, you know stages and sets and i'm working at an artist as an artist in Nickel, uh, nickelodeon you know but we're affected by the national unions bargaining in the same way um so that's sort of like how we all came together and how we uh kind of found what we shared in common great thanks nora and scott go ahead well i'm i'm starting to see a common theme here of uh uh shop floor issues and uh uh, national bargaining that uh, was very disappointing. Uh, that's been something that's been going on in the UAW for a very long time. Uh, so, you know, this reform movement in the UAW didn't just fall out of the sky. Uh, there were uh, people uh, working on reform for decades uh, because of the uh, cooperation scheme that uh, our union was involved with with the companies. Uh, so I had tapped into one of those networks uh, around 2010, uh, but the uh, the corruption scandal in the UAW really opened a uh, uh, an opportunity for reform to take take hold. So in 2019, there were some people that I had met through Auto Worker Caravan uh, that I was talking with, uh, and there was. Uh, uh, somebody that I had met at a constitutional convention that sent me a Facebook message. Uh, he was the president of local 259 in uh, New York City. And uh, that was Brian Schneck. He sent me a, a Facebook message uh, that simply said Article 80 uh, or Article 30. I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, that meant that uh, that was a constitutional clause that, that uh, allowed us to, as members, to file charges against international officers because uh, we had been in the midst of a deep and wide corruption scandal at the international level of our union. 
so uh, that message I returned with uh, Article 8, which I had in mind calling a special convention to change the way we elected those officers uh, from the convention uh, system to the direct one member, one vote system. Uh, and uh, that Facebook message, uh, uh, the following day, uh, we started, we had a conference call out of it. And uh, there are uh, about a dozen people on the conference call, some of them from Auto Worker Caravan, some of them that I had met uh, through Facebook, uh, you know, exchanges, uh, and uh, uh, others that I had met through uh, some of the union organizing, or not organizing, but uh, some of the union conferences and, and uh, uh, committee work that, that I had done. Uh, so that was uh, how we found each other. And then uh, what goals did we share in common? Well, it, it's pretty much right here on my shirt. Uh, you know, no, no concessions, no corruption, and no tears. We had been suffering uh, concessions for 40 years in the UAW, uh, but they had really gone into high gear around 2007. And that's what kind of lit my, uh, my fuse on the uh, uh, reform movement. Uh, you know, I've been working on getting those uh, agreements voted down uh, uh, each time because they were bad agreements. You know, they, they brought us uh, the two tier wage and benefit structure. They took away COLA. Uh, they took away a minute of break time. Uh, you know, the, just some ridiculous concessions that, uh, you know, were, were uh, uh, you know, just so deteriorating to the spirit of the union. And uh, so those were the things that uh, we started to organize around. And, uh, you know, one of our goals or our, our goals really were uh, to uh, fight back against those, those things uh, with uh, democracy and transparency in our union. And we were bound to determine uh, to, to win those uh, uh, through, uh, transforming our, our union, making it more democratic and uh, making it more uh, uh, v uh, open for uh, the members. Great. Thank you, Scott and uh, Nora and Shira. I just want to sort of pull out from that a uh, little, um, you know, you all talked about the things that uh, you and the members were unhappy about. Uh, but what was different in your stories than sort of stories of just saying how bad things are was that you all did something where you brought people into together uh, to, to, with the idea that there was something you could do about that. Uh, so you, 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 you move beyond a, a good description of what sucked uh, to like, all right, let's talk to each other about what we're going to do different about that. So in that context, I'm interested in maybe Scott and Shira, you can talk about this a little bit. Like, how did you move to saying like, but we need a caucus? Like why, why does a caucus matter in your context? What, what, what is that? Some people might say, why don't you just run for election? Or, you know, some people might say, why don't you just leave the union? Uh, but why in particular, did you say like, we need to build a caucus? What did, what did building a caucus mean to you? Well, uh, if it's all right, I'll go ahead and get started with it. Um, so nobody can tackle the uh, size of the problem that we were facing alone. Uh, and, and that's what building a caucus is really. We, we were looking for uh, a group of UAW members that were like-minded uh, that wanted to work together to achieve our goals. Uh, really, that's kind of the definition of a caucus. Uh, and uh, to unseat uh, the administration caucus was going to take uh, something uh, of a counterweight to that, that uh, you know, ingrained uh, bureaucracy. Uh, a little, little history about the administration caucus. Uh, in the UAW, the same group of people uh, have been running the union uh, for uh, since 1947. Uh, at that time, uh, we had a, a very famous president, Walter Ruther. Uh, if you're into labor history at all, you, you know a little bit about Walter Ruther. 
uh, Ruther formed the uh, a caucus in 1947, uh, and they really pushed out all the other uh, uh, challengers to their uh, to their power, and they held power in the UAW uh, from 1947 until last year. They held uh, almost every international executive board seat, and uh, through that. Uh, they were able to uh, they they were able to do that uh, because of um, uh, the convention system and and you know they only had a few uh, people to uh, try and convince to uh, tow the line. Uh, we can get into more about how they towed the line, but uh, really we needed to uh, get some like-minded people together to take on that entrenched power. Uh, and we saw some examples in the labor movement. Uh, so some of those great examples were the uh, caucus of rank and file educators uh, that took over their union in Chicago, the Chicago Teachers Union. Also Teamsters for a Democratic Union. Uh, they had been uh, a caucus uh, working to reform the Teamsters uh, for decades. Uh, so, you know, we, we saw a more recent example and we saw uh, an example that had uh, was really mature. And we tried to take the best of both of those and, and build a, a, a caucus that would uh, be able to, uh, you know, take on the entrenchment of the uh, administration caucus. Uh, so those were uh, some role models for us. And, uh, you know, again, the reason to build a caucus is because nobody does this alone. Uh, and uh, uh, so, that was uh, our, our main initiative for uh, making it a caucus. Thanks, Scott. Sure. Um, so I think uh, I'm going to reference um, CTU also, like Scott did, Scott did with CORE. Um, the CORE caucus was really important for our founding members of the Caucus of Working Educators and the book, How to Jumpstart Your Union. They read the book together 10 years ago or so, 11 years ago, um, and about the 2012 strike. And like, I think that it was sort of a, like a toolbox, like how are you going to do this in your own city? And I think it being um, educators and it being a teacher's union and educator's union was also a connection for PFT members who are thinking about building a caucus too. I think the question that I'm going to focus more on for this is like, why do we still have one? Um, because I think that uh, when you have had a caucus for a really long time and have like moved through different ways of it, sometimes like people are going to leave and they're going to come in and they're going to leave again. And it can be really hard to sustain this idea of a caucus within this very large union. Our union is 13,000 members strong. Um, and our caucus is not nearly that big. And so sometimes you can wonder, like, do we still need this? And I think one of the main reasons that we still have one and feel like we really need one is that um, the caucus is, I think, where people learn how to put this idea of our union is our members into practice um, and really learn how to organize people in their building and learn how to organize people around issues. Um, there are a lot of things that our elected leadership does to give people tools to exist in their schools as shop stewards, as building reps. But in terms of actually doing the thing, I think uh, we, um, by we, I mean working educators in Philly, like in our we meetings, people are learning how to take action and feel like they can do it together with other people in their schools and really take union membership from being a paper member where you pay dues to actually fighting for something with other people collectively. Um, and so I think that's one of the things that has allowed us to, su to sustain our caucus over a long time, this idea of developing new leaders and developing people who can become powerful in their own lives, powerful in their own schools, and then also powerful in fighting for things that impact people all across the city. So it's been really interesting, I think, to see our caucus take on both issues that impact everyone um, in so many schools, like based on region or based on like a policy or based on like a 
contract issue or sick leave policy, things like that. And then also really developing people's ability and capacity to like look at their school and look at the people who are around them and say like, what matters to us? Like what matters to the 20 people that I work with every day or the 50 people or the 70 people and how can we fight for this together? And so sometimes um, I feel like there's this tendency at times for us to be like, you have to pick one. Like, are you going to pick the caucus work? Are you going to pick the building work? And like, they can diverge. But I think we really, in, in sustaining the caucus, we have figured out how these two things can really work together. And so I have had the like honor, I would say, like to work with people who are like becoming really powerful shop stewards in their schools while also doing really amazing work that relates to campaigns that our caucus might be running. But sometimes our caucus is not running a campaign. Um, sometimes the work of our caucus is developing people's ability to fight back against bully bosses or having one-on-ones with members in their school or making a list um, of everybody who is a union member or figuring out how to sign people up for dues since our school, like our school district doesn't do it anymore. We have to do it ourselves. Um, and so I think uh, like the caucus campaign work and the building work um, like interplay each other. And we can't, I don't think that we are able to do that without our caucus. And so the two, like these two ideas or three ideas kind of work together to like help us remember that having like this organization and having this collective of people who are learning how to transform our union from the bottom up is so powerful. And I also just like want to cite something else that I know that a few of us have talked about, like democracy and transparency. Like those are things that are really important in our unions as a whole. And I think what our caucus has allowed us to do is to really start exploring what those things look like in our buildings also. So like one thing that I'm really excited about, um, over the next like six months or so is I really want, I'm really excited about the ways that we want to teach people how to have like more democratic chapter meetings in their schools. Um, how do you have a, how do you facilitate a discussion? Um, how do you make sure that people are coming to your chapter meetings when there's such limited time and when educators are so stretched? So those aren't necessarily um, caucus campaigns to work for transparency Um in like our union, like the big idea of our union, like our PFT, like those are things where we're teaching people and really holding each other to this idea of having democracy and transparency in our chapters. Um, and by chapter, I mean like a school of 20 people or 30 people. Um, because when you have that in our buildings, like people start to expect that beyond also. Um, and also like anyone, I mean, I know a lot of us, like we want to have more union democracy, but having like a really democratic, like exciting, energizing chapter meeting, um, like at, in your shop is so powerful. And like, just the looks of like demoralization when people walk into the room and then leaving with like, wow, that was like really cool. Like solidarity. Like that's something that we really want to teach people um, how to do. So I know that was a little long, but, um, we've been thinking about that a lot in Philly with like, why we still have, why, why a caucus. So we're teaching people how to do it in their schools too. Yeah. And that democracy, uh, angle is, is so important. Uh, and it's, it's something that, uh, you know, we we're working on, uh, in the UAW as well. Uh, we're, we're working on drilling it down into the local level. And uh, like you were talking about, Shira, it's uh, so important to uh, get member engagement through those democratic processes. And I, I had a, uh, have a friend that once said uh, that uh, unions can be the greatest force for democracy in this country. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, he, nothing could be further from the or, uh, you know, that, that's that's so true. That's so true uh, that we build democratic processes uh, by getting the workers involved. I just want to say I totally agree. Like that stuck out to me too, Shira, is that like creating um, these systems within your caucus that teach people to lead the more they participate in it. And um, the feeling of that being so powerful for people that like democracy and actually having your voice heard 
um, and having it lead to change is not a far off concept because it is so far off, especially if you're an American <laughs> and you like participate in the American system of democracy too. It can feel like nothing you do is democratic and, um, and that maybe de democracy doesn't even work that well, but actually seeing it work like in a meeting is like one step towards like really um, empowering and like giving people hope. Oh, thank you, everyone. Um, uh, the next step or the next question uh, is for Nora. Um, so what were some steps you took that built the core of crew um, and gave you a shared sense of purpose? And I imagine, you know, some of that was what you just spoke to. Yeah, yeah. Like, I think um, having having been around in 2021, um, where this group of people kind of came together in Hollywood, but, you know, they tried and they didn't really, they were, they were thinking more issue based. Um, and then seeing how well it works when you're not just issue based. I think the work of a caucus is in organizing around the issue first and then connecting it to this bigger picture. So getting both people and their union leadership to stop thinking in these three year contract cycles and hammering home that like these issues well, aren't going to get fixed unless there's a really strong member channel for uh, your voice to come through. And then like starting to kind of look at your union structure and the way it runs and the way the power is concentrated, you start building this like knowledge on how you can change those things. And um, and that's something that like the Teamsters for a Democratic Union is really clear about doing. And um, we um, took a lot of uh, uh, steps in the beginning to kind of like really like hone down on um, what we wanted we started working on this like governing document and principles immediately we needed to be all on the same page we separated our collective wants into like these four pillars democracy education solidarity and strong contracts we wrote things under these headers and we approved them anyone who joined the caucus after that had to read and agree to them um and then we also um reached out uh to a lot of other um union uh, members um, in the process and um, uh, started thinking um, in the way of like, um, uh, and uh, by other union members, sorry, I meant uh, other uh, developers of other caucuses. Because um, I think broadly in IATSE, there's this like deep dissatisfaction with the way that the union is run and that kind of makes your job easier. But the more trans trans more uh, like transmogative or transformative aspect is still not on people's minds. The, the typical byline of the IATSE member who's frustrated is, well, we should impeach the international president, that'll fix it. But you have to push that further. Um, and when you're thinking about like building your core membership, it's not just the president's fault that you have the culture of disinformation and lack of understanding of your contracts. There's this whole waterfall structure here that yes, you know, starts at the top, but we have to ask people to look at how a president can be even put into power um, without so much uh, as a vote of a single rank and file member, and then ask them if that's a system that that they think should stay in place if things are going to change around here. And that's sort of like the conversations that we started having with people when we brought them into the caucus, because you have to build up, you can't just stay small. Um, we had some difficulty at the beginning too. You know, people were concerned with like security. They didn't want anyone to say the word caucus. So uh, we started voting on things, um, you know, uh, and that was sort of kind of to Shira's point, like the way that we flexed these democratic structures, right? Like every step we took, we voted on it, we wrote that down and then voting becomes easier, being more democratic becomes easier. It, become, it, it comes to you a little bit easier. Um, we set out a system that would teach people how to lead the more that they participated in it. We had a system of uh, selecting a group of three coordinators that facilitate the meetings, do agendas, and then they rotate out every three months. So people who have never led anything in their lives, you know, they're forced to kind of become a leader, even temporarily, and facilitate. Um, so uh, 
after all of this stuff, we kind of talked about security and then, uh, you know, we worked for a year. We didn't go public until it was a planned thing that everybody knew beforehand. And the result was we had this very strong sense of shared purpose and like a, a very diverse representation across many locals because we really did the work of like bringing in other voices that we hadn't heard before and then getting them on board with the idea um, and the kind of principles of change. Could you say a little bit more, Nora, before we move on to the next question about like very specifically what you did most recently before you came out of the caucus and how you, you know, you had this webinar, but you had, to, you had to get people to that webinar. So could you sort of tell the steps that you took in terms of reaching out to people? Right. Yeah. So, um, so we talked with um we have we have like a lot of like people that we talked to so i um we've talked to ken path from tdu we've talked to jesse sharkey from ctu from uh the the teachers that have been mentioned sarah hughes was a big influence but more, most recently we we contacted ellen david friedman for this private chat she was uh through labor notes and um so she gave us a lot of advice and uh, one of them was pick a goal and stick to it and then that will be sort of like where you kind of like uh, your little north compass uh, 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 your north star uh, for when you're organizing to your event because as we learned from CTU um, the only way you attract doers is by doing things so um, kind of moving out of that like sort of just like talking to each other and talking about the problems and the where we wanted to go we had to actually actually do something so we had this big um, national webinar uh, it was called our contract our fight um, uh, a rank and file member forum um, and so uh, what our uh, union wasn't doing was bringing people from all these international unions to give opinions um, and like uh, give their thoughts about their aspirations for the union. Um, and uh, we wanted to bring that together and get a, a good chunk of IATSE members uh, working on that. So then we talked with Lisa Shu, who's here right now. Um, <laughs> and she actually gave us uh, some training on um, list building. And so we were building these sort of like lists uh, from our own con uh, con contact databases that we had, people we knew, putting them all in lists and sort of like working out um, uh, what's called list work um, and uh, sort of learning through doing that. Uh, and that was how we got this sort of like big database of people where we're kind of like reaching out to them and kind of doing the work of uh telling them about this um kind of debut uh event and then uh making it um so that our first event uh, represents our movement which is a national movement you know it's not going to start from hollywood we aren't like hollywood only focused you know we wanted it to be inclusive of everybody um and so i think that was really successful uh because um it kind of put us on the map in people's minds like wow like people are coming together like that's something that I can join on to and I think a lot of IATSE members are so fractured because of our the nature of um, how separated our work is uh, and how we're, we are national uh, a lot of people are, are probably thinking the same things doing the same things that we are looking at the same uh, kind of structures that we are and analyzing them and, and thinking how can I change this and to kind of be a beacon where where you can kind of snowball all of those people into the same place has been like really, really good because once they they see you on the stage, they they kind of just come to you. Thanks. So I, Scott mentioned, you mentioned this a little bit and uh, Nora just talked about it, but I'm wondering uh, for Shira and maybe Scott, if you have more to say about this too, this idea of like, you know, you've talked about building the caucus as like, you can't do it alone uh within your union but then what i also hear is like you're not doing it alone as caucus building either that you're reaching out to others you're finding resources and they'd be really important for the folks who are listening to get a sense of like what are some of the resources that you've used in order to build your caucus and 
Maybe we can hear from Shira and Scott if you want to jump in about that a little bit. Good, yeah. Shira. Yeah. I can, yeah, I can share briefly. I think um, I'm like thinking about two buckets, I guess, of resources that we've pulled from. One has been like the um, science and method and tools and like all of the handouts, like secrets of a successful organizer, like all of the stuff that we need to be able to do the needed work of organizing in our schools and in our caucus, um, learning how to make a workplace chart, learning how to talk to an administrator, a manager, um, all of those things we've pulled from both labor notes and then also um, other union organizers, especially in Philly, who um, have been generous both like with their time and also like the tools that they've used in their own union work. So I think like that's one set of resources um because those relationships are so important and then i think the second one um has been to reach out to people who are also um educator caucuses union members organizers etc in other parts of the country who have had really big wins um and i think like being able to talk to people who have had really big wins in their schools and then also really big wins um, in their, in terms of like their whole union membership, like both are really important because uh, like you have like union, like the union, and then you also have your union members. And like, we're getting to a place where we want both of those to mean the exact same thing. Um, but not every thing, not every place is there yet. Um, so we have talked to people in, um, Chicago, in New York, in Los Angeles, in Portland, in every city, in Massachusetts, um, North Carolina, like people who are doing the work of fighting, like the phrase that so many of us have probably heard, like the schools our students and our staff and our families deserve, and really pulling on lessons from um, rank and file members, um, from union leaders, from people who are in caucuses, from people who are not in caucuses, because regardless of whether we're in a caucus or not, I think, um, like we're all do like, we're all doing the organizing work and people are at, you know, in different places in terms of what that looks like. Um, so I think like talking, for example, to people, um, in Los Angeles during their really powerful strike in 2019 that came off of many years of, building structures to make that really powerful in their school, in their schools across the city. Like that was like a very formative moment, I think, for a lot of um, caucus organizers, because it was like, wow, this is what this is what happens when you build power in a chapter. This is what happens when you build power across a city and like looking at all of the like points, A, B, C, D, E, F, G in between. So that's just one example. Um, that was like feels I can't believe it's like almost five years ago. Um, but I think like talking to people who are doing the same work um, as us has been really useful and like talking to people in caucuses and also to people who aren't um, or who have, you know, who haven't gotten there yet or who aren't planning to, um, because I think that organizing work and like finding the things that we want to change and win, um, like hearing those lessons, I think can like boost our own morale too, where we don't have to be we don't have to be alone in our shops and in our um, workplaces. And we also don't have to be alone in our caucuses too. Um, and I think those moments and relationships have been um, really important for people that I'm like very close to and working educators in terms of realizing like, wow, like I'm, I'm not alone. Like you're not alone in your school and you're also not alone in your union membership and in your experiences a rank and file educator and you're also not alone as an educator um because being an educator right now is rough uh, being a worker is rough um it always has been so yeah so i want to give scott if you say something but i just also want to just jump in from my experience listening listening to you share also thinking about what we learn by teaching others like i've known share for a while been a part of watching working educators develop as a caucus and that when you get to go out and talk to other people who are asking you questions, how did you do this, that there's the development of knowledge in that too. 
so how we are how we are talking to each other about the work and teaching each other. Scott, I didn't know if you want to jump in with something there. Go ahead. Yeah, I just I just want to talk about the the importance of networking, and uh, I, I think that's what Shiro was getting at was was uh, networking across the country. And one of the best places to be able to network is a labor notes conference. Uh, they only happen every two years, and we skipped one during the pandemic. Uh, but they're they're an excellent opportunity to get to know people that are fighting the fight that you're fighting. Uh, and and there's so so much to learn, but there's also so many people to meet that you can learn from in between conferences. Uh, so that's so important. Uh, another thing uh, with networking is uh, attend, you know, join join your local union uh, standing committees, attend union conferences. You'll get to know other people within your union. Uh, you'll get to know both sides, right? You'll get to uh, know the uh, the ones that are entrenched, and you'll get to know a few people that are are uh, really thinking about what the possibilities could be uh, to transform their union. Uh, so those are a couple of things that stuck out to me uh, uh, about uh, you know resources. Uh, but in the UAW, there were uh, there were networks of of people that had been working to reform the union for decades. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's important to find those people to act as mentors. Uh, I've had mentors. Uh, I've mentored other people. Uh, and it, it's it's important to find uh, those people that have been through those battles before and can help you uh, pull together. And, uh, you know, I, I, I first learned about fighting uh, a bad contract uh, by passing out flyers at my own plant. And we've got it voted down, but then it passed nationally. Uh, so I, I knew then that I had to expand that network outside of the, the realm of just my local. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's where, uh, you know, being involved in, in union committees and being involved in the uh, labor uh, movement uh, and who puts the movement in the labor movement, but labor notes. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's some of the uh, things that I've tapped into. Yeah. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for the advertisement for the 2024 Labor Notes Conference. I, I dropped the registration link in the chat, which I hope people can access. Um, uh, yeah, well, we're going to have a lot of programming about caucuses and reforming your union at, at the conference, so everyone should come. Um, so I think we're just going to skip a couple questions just so we can um, get to uh, your questions um, in time. So uh, this question is for Scott and Shara. Um, how have you negotiated the relationship between organizing around a specific issue and organizing to transform your union as a whole? So kind of a broader, deeper focus. Um, so uh, Shara, if you want to start with that. Yeah, I um, I think like I, I talked a little bit about this before, so I think I'll just echo it again. Um, I think that both of those things with focusing on issues that matter um, to our workers, to our educators, and then by extension, our students and our families, and then transforming the union, um, that they can work in tandem with each other. They don't have to be in contradiction with each other. I think that we can keep them separate, but I also think that we can make sure that they are um, like allowing us to do not necessarily like parallel things, but like two kinds of work that can really intersect. Um, I think doing like the work of transforming our unions has to start in our, like at least I know for us, like it has to start in our shops and our schools um, in order to get to a place of transforming like really big picture. Um, it's like all of the ways in which we have transformed our union big picture so many of them have started in our school buildings. Um, we have had people organize um, around getting asbestos remediated in our schools. Asbestos is a huge problem in Philly. Um, other toxins that are making our students and us really, really sick. Um, making sure that um, our buildings are safe. Making sure um, that we have exactly what we need to be able to do our jobs. Um, getting 
heaters fixed, getting air conditioning, like all of the things, like these are just facilities issues. Like there's a very long list of things that our members, um, PFT members, and also people who are involved in our caucus have organized around. And um, I think like there's this, I know, and I know that like a, many people have probably heard this before. There's a phrase um, in TDU work and Teamsters for a Democratic Union um, work where you aim for the boss and you hit the union. And I think when we finally figured out that that's the direction that we could go in, like when we started really focusing on our schools and then focusing on citywide issues that really affected, I would say, a majority of workers across the city. So like facility facilities issues, really dehumanizing sick leave policies, those things are going to get the attention of um, people very quickly. And they will also get the attention of other union members, the people who are elected to lead our union, um, our school level bosses, our district bosses, every, there's so many layers of management in the school district of Philadelphia. And so I think like we are transforming it very slowly and we don't know and cannot predict when a school level issue will set something off citywide. Um, and I think it's up to us to like be able to kind of go with the flow and like see what is going to like become very exciting for people outside of a school or if it doesn't like how to really support people in an individual school building or a few school buildings to still win um even if it doesn't like set fire across the whole city um and so i think like we we balance both by doing both at the same time uh which is very hard but i also think that being disciplined in making sure that the two are connected with each other um, and that we're really focusing on our school buildings um, right now in terms of where we are as a caucus has helped us do that. Um, and I also think ultimately like there are ways in which, and I know that there are ways in which that being a union member um, in Philadelphia, being a, T a PFT member um, has shifted and it has changed and it, and it ebbs and flows. Like we know that like, history, you know, takes things in different directions. Um, and it's a process of like evolution. But I think that especially since we was founded in 2013, I think that um, like there is this idea of solidarity that um, is extremely prevalent in for many PFT members. And then also in some ways, like there's still in many ways, there's still like so much more work to be done. But when we keep reminding ourselves that like it starts in our buildings, like that's where we are as a caucus. I think that we can reach a lot of people um, that way. So that is how we balance both. It's really hard, but um, we are trying our best to make sure that they intersect as much as possible. Thank you, Shira. Uh, go ahead, Scott. Yeah, well, I, I agree with Shira that, uh, you know, the two concepts are not mutually exclusive, right? Uh, you know, you're looking at issues, uh, you know, up front, but those issues are the things that are going to transform your union. Uh, so, uh, you know, for us uh, in the UAW, uh, the issue was that the uh, the union was in the boss's pocket. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, we felt it for uh, for a long time. Uh, uh, but then it, then it was right there in our face. So that gave us not only the issue. Uh, but also what needed to be done to begin the process of tra transforming our union. Uh, we're we're uh, by no means done transforming our union, uh, but, you know, we've come a long way. Uh, so, you know, some of those issues are, are going to help you uh, stay focused uh, on the, on the, uh, the, ultimate goal of transforming our union. So, you know, with UAWD, uh, you know, we started out uh, fighting corruption, right? Uh, you know, the the boss or the union with, uh, leadership was literally in the pockets of the company leadership. Uh, so we had to fight that corruption uh, to begin with. And that's how we formed. That's what we formed around. That was the core of our, of our uh, impetus uh, to form a caucus. Uh, and, and then from there, we went into uh, uh, trying to democratize our union, right? So, you know, from uh, fighting corruption to, all right, how do you keep corruption at bay? 
it, democracy and transparency. Uh, so, you know, we worked on democratizing, democratizing the UAW. Uh, it was both through uh, the constitutional means where we were organizing for a, a special convention to do that. Uh, but then COVID hit and and put all that, uh, you know, an end to all, all that organizing. Uh, so then we tried to work through the courts and, and then we got the consent decree uh, that allowed us to have a referendum. So there was another issue that we were working on. It was democracy. It was something that would transform our union. Uh, and then from democracy, uh, once we won democracy, we had to find uh, good candidates. And then we had to get them elected. So, you know, each issue is is building a, upon uh, another to uh, ultimately transform your union into a union that uh, is of, for, and by uh, the membership. Great. And wins remarkable. Get some remarkable wins uh, in your stand-up strike as well. Yeah. Um, okay, we're going to turn chat on. Thank you, uh, Nora and Scott and Shira. Um, we're going to put the chat on and invite uh, a few questions. Um, so if you want to put those in there um, and then uh, we'll look through them and take about 15 minutes to answer questions. So go ahead and um, Okay, just gonna take a look here at those, invite our uh, panelists to look as well and maybe answer, pick a question that you would be interested. Um, got Cassie's asking a question about announcing. Oh, we just announced I can answer. That one. <laughs> yeah, you want to take that one up, Nora, how you came to that decision? Uh, I actually find that like, um, uh, so I've been looking at like a lot of different, like, um, the way that caucuses kind of present themselves online. Um, and uh, I wanted to sort of like push that a little bit more. Um, we're very much drawing from a lot of the, um, uh, the kind of like, established caucuses like TDU because TDU has the sort of like online presence that's very educationally focused. Um, they have a lot of like resources and they become like a hub for people who want to understand their union better in that um, they, they in their presence, um, both on the shop floors and um, and uh, in their presence online. So we're in we're a national caucus. So we were thinking that a lot of our stuff had to be um, kind of like um, pushed in the, the webosphere, <laughs> honestly, um, in order to have these national conversations that are all going to take place via Zoom, honestly. Um, so uh, we kind of looked at uh, branding a little bit, um, and we thought that it was pretty important to us. Um, uh, and how does it happen through actions? Um, I think you should definitely plan around like a big event um, that brings your union together to do what you want to see more of in your union. If that's transparency, more democracy, whatever it is, for us, we wanted to see people talk to each other more. Um, and I think that that is kind of the step the first step to getting people thinking more about democracy is people will come out uh, if they think that they will be heard on their issues. Um, so we, uh, the event was structured around um, gathering people's um, uh, aspirations for the upcoming contract cycle, and then um, kind of conglomerating all of those, uh, all of that feedback into a, a report of demands that we're working on. And those demands would go out publicly to our leadership, um, because a lot of the time, uh, it's not clear um, how uh, people are supposed to uh, get their uh, proposals in on a table in front of their employers uh, using the national leadership system that's currently in place. It's not clear to a lot of people. It's confusing. People don't know what they're fighting for. So creating a central hub where people could come 
to the the event, come and talk to each other, hear from each other, understand each other's uh, issues better. That's what you want your union to do. Um, so try and think in that kind of a way uh, where you both have like presence online, right? Um, I think our website is pretty cool. Uh, it gets people excited. Um, Iatsicrew.com. And then also thinking about like what you'll do, like making sure that um, you don't just look like a flash in the pan um, and that your actions are uh, belying like the underlying core principles. So trying to actually do some kind of event, you know, I think it would be easier with like a, a local locally focused caucus because you could do the event in person <laughs> um, or in the region or in the area. Um, but yeah, I would I would combine those two things as sort of an online presence where you can get the word out that way and then also an event. So there are a ton of good questions here. Um, I don't know if Scott or sure others have like I know which ones I'd like you to answer, but I'm wondering if there are any that you're reading that you're interested in answering. Well, I, I uh, started reading from the beginning, so I'll start with the first one, and and that was, and, and I've been in that situation, right? You know, I've been uh, the vice president of my local union, uh, and uh, I was, uh, you know, basically the only uh, reform candidate or the only reform officer uh, in the room, right? So uh, I, I did that. I, I uh, put together a caucus uh, to run for local union office uh, along with me uh didn't end up winning in that next election that was 2019 uh but uh you know the the main thing is that you uh don't give up uh when you the only way to lose is is to quit uh so in 2019 in the beginning of 2019 i lost a uh, bid for president in my local union uh by the end of 2019 i was forming uh uh, helping to form uh, Unite All Workers for Democracy. Uh, so, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, you're going to get roadblocks, you're going to get uh, rough patches. Uh, but as long as you don't give up, uh, you're you're going to continue building on, uh, you know, building on the, the uh, reforms that you want to see. Uh, and you got to continue organizing your members. It, you know, you can't stop talking to your members uh, when you lose a, a tough election. Uh, that's that's the advice that I would have. Uh, and uh, also, I wanted to uh, point out uh, that Ron was the next question, and, and uh, I was remiss in, in uh, uh, not pointing to uh, Railroad Workers United as uh, uh, one of the examples that uh, we uh, looked to when uh, we were uh, forming a caucus, because uh, they've done some great work. Uh, and uh, you know, when you have, I've been in both situations, when you have a convention system, and now we have the, the direct election system, the, the convention system is so much tougher. Uh, we had to, uh, uh, we had to organize around contract time, right? We had to organize no votes on, on bad contracts. Uh, and, you know, we, we would try and get delegates elected to those conventions and, and build a network of, of uh, getting delegates elected. Uh, even in now that, uh, you know, in 2022, uh, we didn't have a majority of the delegates uh, in the convention. Uh, but, you know, we we did make some uh, some changes that, uh, you know, we weren't able to make to make before uh, the corruption scandal had had made major headlines. So there there is, uh, you know, definitely a rough time there when, uh, you know, I was a delegate to the convention in 2010. Uh, 2014, 2018, and 2022, and uh, the first three were uh, pretty rough experiences. Uh, but you know, you have to stick with it. I just wanted to say there were a couple of requests for um, I think our panelists to share their contact info. If you if the panelists feel like dropping your emails or whatever in the chat or the website for your caucus for those who haven't seen that yet, um, please do so. Um, and I just put my email in the chat as well. And for for those who aren't aware, I, I'm in touch with uh, workers who are organizing within the UFCW um, uh, around reform. So I saw some conversation around that. So just wanted to let you know, I put my email in the chat as well for those who wanna be connected. Sure, did any of those questions hop out at you? 
Yeah, um, a few did. I wrote down a few. Um, I'm going to try to keep my answers short on a few of them. Um, there was one about uh, what do you do about people who say that caucuses are divisive? Uh, do it anyway. They're wrong. <laughs> um, and just like keep doing it. Um, I think that people realize that they're not divisive when they just like see you doing it anyway. Um, I think that it's just a scare tactic. Um, and in the same way that, uh, like I keep telling this to people in terms of like what they're doing in their schools around like difficult situations where people are using scare tactics, administrators are using scare tactics, like they're scare tactics and they're meant to make us stop, but don't let them make you stop. Um, so do it anyway. Um, uh, you do not have to run, uh, you do not have to run. Um, I will just leave it at that. Um, you do not need your caucus to run ever. Um, you can if you want to, um, but you don't have to. So I think that like combating this idea that that's necessary right now is like part of it, both um, for you, not by you, like who asked the question, but just like for ourselves and then also for people who we talk to. It's not a requirement. Um, so I think that's one thing that's really important. We can do it at some point, but we don't have to do it now. Um, there was one question about how do we ID issues? I think one thing I've learned um, is that when we're IDing issues as a caucus, it's really important for people to talk about what their issues are at their jobs. Um, and that can really help bring people together around this idea of like both transforming our union and then um, like transforming our workplaces. Um, so not just like what are issues with the structure of our union, but like what are issues that you're facing um, at your job. So that has been really important for us. Um, and then there was another one um, about how to keep people engaged and how to run like a good meeting. I think like one thing that I have found is like being okay with people who are not necessarily ready to join a caucus. It's okay. Like invite them anyway. Not everybody is going to be ready to like go to all of the um, webinars. I used to be like, I only want to talk to people who like want to go to all the webinars and like read all the books and talk about this all the time that it's okay if they don't want to. It's like, okay, if they only come sometimes, um, there will be people who like really want to dive in deep um, super fast, but also it takes people um, a long time sometimes to get there just because like people are really busy. Like our families need us, like our jobs need us, Our per we need to take care of ourselves, et cetera. So um, I think like having ways that people can come to a meeting and talk and like really getting to know people one-on-one -on -one is super helpful to keep people engaged um, and uh, inviting people to things like this. Like I'm invited uh, someone that I work with to a labor notes thing next week. Um, and like, we're gonna go together. And so like, if you're gonna go to something, invite one person to come. Um, and then in terms of like how to run engaging meetings, I think that one thing that I have learned, um, it's just so important to have people uh, talk to each other, like in small groups, like at um, at our schools now, like I always tell people, like make sure that your meetings are where people are not sitting with people in their grade team or like not sitting with people that they already talked to and like have the questions be really open. Like, how was your day? Um, or like, what's something that was really rough this week? Um, and I have found that some of the most energizing meetings that I've been in and have been ones where the question is really open um, and people like find their way um, to like wanting to take action or what the next step is. And then also on the flip side too, I think that having um, a next step in place or like having a plan or like having like, so what are we all going to do next is also really important because it helps people remember that they did not just come to talk about what the problem is. Um, and so like figuring out ways to connect um, what's going on to like what we can do about it um, can be like a good uh, a good meeting like if I'm talking as like if I'm talking for more than you know however much time you want to decide in a meeting before people are talking to each other like it's not a, it's not a good meeting um, so like making sure that people are talking to each other for big blocks of time 
Um, and then really being able to hear what other people are saying. So like having really good share outs and report outs with a stack so that people can listen to each other um, are, I think, what make make our union meetings ones where people want to come back. And um, how to keep people focused on building power without getting mired in politics with executive boards and councils and things. Um, I think that that um, that has been like big, like we've gotten so much advice from so many successful councils that you really you just can't involve leadership in the in the equation at all, almost like. Um, the things that you do don't, you don't have to be in a leader, leadership position to do them. You can do the things that you want your union, the work that you want your union can, to do, you can do it. Um, you can find ways to do it. Um, and uh, when it comes to talking about elected officers, just our technique has been to completely ignore them because it doesn't matter who is in the leadership seat as long as the processes that got them there are undemocratic. Um, and I think that everyone wants um, more of a say in who leads them um, and how their their leadership is elected. Um, so we often say that we don't, we do not even talk about like leaders at all. Uh, we don't think that it, it's productive um, and it doesn't focus people on the right things because um, even if we ousted all of our leadership, we would still have these same systems. And that's sort of like what we try to tell people. Um, and, uh, um, you know, don't be afraid uh, if, you know, uh, a leader calls you something like, um, you know, you're trying to destroy the union or something like that. Uh, we have not like really engaged with that at all. And that's been really successful for us. Um, uh, if, if people feel challenged by the idea of changing a system, then that's their problem. Hey, great. I think, um, I'm just blown away by how great these questions are, to be honest. Um, and I, so I just want to uplift something that was said in the chat, which is um, some of these great questions we weren't able to answer today. Um, some we might actually address in our future webinars on caucus development. So definitely come back for those. Um, but here is the book, Democracy is Power, uh, which is written by the late Mike Parker, who is a member of UAWD um, and Martha Gruel. Um, it's a really great book. Um, it's uh, grapples with a lot of uh, questions. Um, that were asked in the chat. So I recommend people check that out. Um, so um, we're going to head into wrapping this up and we're actually gonna end with a question for the panelists on what are questions you think we should be asking you and other caucus members as we continue to develop this series? What, are, what do you think some of the most important questions um, you, know, you would want uh, workers starting their own caucus to, to be asking you. Um, so uh, start with, you can start with you, Scott, since you're already unmuted. Well, I, I would start with a bunch of the questions that we didn't get to in the chat. That's that's for sure. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of them that uh, piqued my interest was uh, uh, how do you uh, navigate uh, the, the politics uh, when you're a newly elected officer, uh, and uh, you know you have uh, uh, you know longer term officers there that uh, have been in the entrenched bureaucracy, uh, and that's all that they really know. Uh, so you know that would be one that I would recommend you, we take up the next time, uh, and uh, or you know whoever you all take up the next time, uh, and uh, so. There you go. There's my suggestion. All right, um, Nora. Uh, I think a really good one is um, uh, how do you implement a caucus that operates in a democratic way, and how do you implement a caucus that um, teaches other people to be leaders? Because um, that's uh, what you want. Cool. Thank you, uh, Shara. 
Um, I, I was thinking about the same thing that Nora was in terms of like, how do we build leadership? Like, how do we build our own leadership? Um, how do we build the leadership of other um, rank and file members who are organizing in their workplaces? Um, and then I also, I just wrote this down earlier, like um, in terms of like why we are all here. Um, I feel like going back to the question of like, what, um, what do you want like to change about your workplace and what do you want to change about um, what it means to be a member of your union can be really important because sometimes it, um, it's just like really easy to lose sight of like why we're here. Um, and so I feel like that first question of like, what do we really want to change about um, our work or like our workplace? And, you know, what do we want to change about what it not just our union, but like what it means to be a member of our union um, can help us figure out what we want to do and then what we want potentially um, our caucus to do too. Great. Thank you. I think we're going to take up these questions, some of the questions in the chat. Um, does Barbara and I plan uh, the future uh, webinars? Um, I guess, um, you know, as we close this out, I just want to say, you know, I spent a lot of time working with UAW members um, in UAWD. Now I'm getting to work with members of a lot of other caucuses. I think um, there are definitely a lot of common lessons to be shared across all the caucuses. I know I'm noticing a lot of similarities. At the same time, every workplace is different. Every union is different um, uh, in, in important ways. So I don't think you know, I feel like, you know, just in the short time I've been at Labor Notes, it's clear there's not sort of like a one size fits all solution. You're going to have to figure out how to build the reform caucus in, in your union. And it's probably going to look a little different from, um, you know, UAWD, IOTC crew or um, caucus of working educators. So, um, but I am so excited to see everyone who's been on this call and all the different unions they represent and you know, everyone grappling with trying to organize a reform caucus. And um, uh, Barbara and I both shared our contact information in the chat. I'm just gonna drop my email again because it probably got lost up there. So um, please don't hesitate to um, reach out to us um, if you, uh, you know, have questions or need support. Um, and yeah, thank you everyone for joining. Barbara, do you want to say any parting words? Um, I, I, be honest, I'm reading Stanley's uh, comments in the chat uh, and it just makes me want to say like, yeah, Stanley, it's hard sometimes to do this work. Uh, and I think all of our um, uh, panelists talked about really reaching out and finding other people so you're not alone in this work that's that's what the caucuses give us is a shared project and comrades to do the work with um but also feel free to reach out about that and uh the last thing is just like the chat is blowing my mind i mean scott nora sure you blew my mind you were great and then like the sense of like the networking possibilities for all of us out there to be helping each other transform our unions and as Scott said earlier, like we democratize our unions, we actually get real democracy, not just in our unions. Um, it's it's really exciting, and I'm really grateful for all of you, uh, for and for being able to do the work with you all. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you again to our wonderful panelists um, and to everyone who joined. Um, I'm gonna wait a few seconds before closing the chat, because I see people are sharing contact uh, information, but thank you again to everyone who joined. Uh, we did record this, so we'll be sending out the recording uh, to everyone. And uh, again, uh, so, uh, you know, if everyone wants to exchange contact information tonight, wasn't able to do so, please email me and I'll try to put you in touch with the right person. Um, okay, all right, good night and hope to see you again for the next uh, caucus uh, development webinar. Yes. Thanks, y'all. Good night. Bye. Thanks, you guys. Bye bye. Good night.
Okay, leaving the chat open slightly longer by by request. <laughs> Everyone should feel free to hop.